So in the Old Testament, the book of the prophet of Isaiah, Isaiah 53 and 5, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The amazing thing to me about that verse is that was a prophet Isaiah. That was many, many years before Jesus was on earth. That's amazing. And just like that, the song we're going to sing today is, Were You There? And Trust Me. The answer is yes. You were there. The price has been paid. Amen. Thank you, uh, Jay. The um, how true that uh, song is. Were you there? No, we weren't there physically, but God did. Uh, God did um, die on the cross for us. And as that song says, you know, ask all those questions about. You know, were you there at this point, at this point, at this point? That's exactly what we've been studying. So take your Bibles with us, with me to, this morning to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Um, that we've been in Mark chapter 15 since, um, since February. Um, we are, this is the last time we will be in Mark 15. Next week, we will begin the first day of the week. And we will talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, Jesus, um, here in our text today, Jesus was buried. My question that I've asked is, who is on the Lord's side? Who, in this text today, as we'll look, we find two groups of people. We find the ladies in verses 40 and 41, which I didn't cover much last week. The ladies were standing by the cross. They saw Jesus crucified. I believe they followed Jesus through the streets as he carried his cross. I believe they saw all why these were women who ministered to Christ all through his ministry. 
um, that we, we, we are given names. Each gospel gives a little bit different perspective of which women were there and which women weren't. And you put them all together, you get a little picture of the Marys that were there. I think there were three different Marys, the mother of Jesus and um, the, the Mar Mary of Magdalene. And the, the, there is here in this text, there's Mary, the, um, the, the, the mother of Joseph, uh, jo Joseph or whoever. Um, that, you know, it's probably a, an aunt to Christ, a sister to Mary. Um, but uh, we're not really sure, and it doesn't really matter. But we find that this group of people came and they followed Christ. And then there was a group of people, and we'll call them the secret followers, and we're going to see that in just a minute. They were the ones who feared. And so today we're going to talk about this courage and fear and how, and, and, and how, we, uh, how we handle that. How, how are you today? Who is on the Lord's side is the question I'll ask. But as we start this, this morning, I want us to look at the text. One of the things I have started to do in my, in my study is, first of all, I like breaking the text down. I like seeing the words and, 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 and what the words mean and how, the, how they apply to one another and how they come together. And for instance, in this text, you find that the body is mentioned twice, um, that you find that, the, uh, that, that Joseph uh, comes and asks for the body of Christ, and then Pilate finally gives the body over. There are two different Greek words, and why are there two different Greek words? All those things are almost like a puzzle, and you try putting all these together. And I like looking at the text and finding out what the text is saying. Then I always ask myself a question, so what? What does that mean to us? And so then I give a challenge. What, how, how can you take this text? And we're familiar with this text. Jesus died on the cross. Joseph comes and says, I'd like to bury the body. Pilate gives him the body. And he takes the body to, to his own tomb, and he buries Christ in the tomb, and, um, you know, and, and that's the burial. I mean, we understand the text. But how does that then apply to us? What does that mean? And so we're going to look at some of these here this morning. But before we start, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to look at the text. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this text, for how it applies to my life, it applies to our lives as people. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would not just hear the text, but Lord, we would, um, that we would hear it and apply it. And so Lord, be with each one listening, if it be online or if it be here in person this morning, uh, that Lord, we may be blessed and encouraged by your word. Open our spiritual eyes for understanding today. Allow my voice to be your voice, your words coming out of my mouth. We do thank you in Christ Jesus' name, amen. So here in our text, we see four things, and I like to uh, briefly look at these four things. First of all, in, verses, uh, in verse 42 and 43, we find Joseph's, uh, Joseph's request. It tells us that Joseph of Arimathea, in verse 43, comes to Pilate and, um, and, uh, and asks, for, asks for the body. But you notice how, jo how, uh, how Mark introduces this. Okay, Mark says this, now when evening had come. Now you have to understand that uh, 6 o'clock in the evening was a new day in Israel. Okay, their days went from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, so at 6 p.m. it became the Sabbath. Okay, on the Sabbath, the Jewish people weren't allowed to do any work. And so the Sabbath, Saturday, was a day of preparation. And the Word of God says that it, it, was, it was evening had come. It was almost ready to turn 6 o'clock. And Jesus was still hanging on the cross. And Joseph and I believe Nicodemus, both of them, uh, came and, and said. And notice what it says. Because the day of preparation, because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. And so there is no question when Jesus died. Nobody, none of the Gospels argue when Jesus died. He died the day before the Sabbath. Okay, it was day, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Jesus died. Now, some people today say, well, if he was supposed to be in the grave three days and three nights, how can that be, you know, it, you know with, with it, 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 him being there on Friday? Well, you have to understand in the Jewish mind, a day, day and night is considered a day. So, so when you use a partial day, that's still considered day and night. That's still considered a day. And from what I understand from my studies, okay, we find that he died on, 
on Friday, um, you know, probably by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So therefore, that partial day is considered day and night. It's considered one day. And then on Saturday all day, day and night. And then on Sunday morning when the women came early in the morning, okay, it had been Sunday already since 6 o'clock the night before, Saturday night. So he had been in the grave for a partial of a day, three days um, we, we see this. Now, we could argue that, and I'm not going to, because the, the, the argument Satan wants us to have. Satan wants us to argue, are we go, what day was he, was, he, was he crucified on? What day did they have good, the, the, the last supper on? What day? It doesn't really matter. The fact is, Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's what the Word of God says. And so here, as Mark starts out, he just throws this little information, and he says, okay, on the day of preparation before the Sabbath. Why? Because these men had to rush, because they couldn't do it. By 6 o'clock that night, they had to be done. Okay, it's interesting. According to the Jewish law, they could only walk so far. I don't know how far it was between where the cross was and where he was buried, but it's very possible that just carrying the body, first of all, carrying the body was, was not possible. They, they, they weren't supposed to do that on the Sabbath. But taking them from the cross to the grave would be something that would probably be, be considered work and they weren't supposed to do. So they had to rush it in before the end of the day. And so that's the picture. They come and, and they gave a request to Joseph. Notice here, Joseph is described in verse 43. And notice how Mark describes him. He's identified as a Jewish man from Arimathea. Okay, notice what it says, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was a Jewish town. Possibly, if you go back to Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, they, they believe that that was the same town Samuel was born, to, born in. Um, why he gives this information, I was not really sure why. Does that mean that that, that town was a rich town? And we, we know that Joseph probably had a little bit of money because he had a sepulcher and he was hewed, hewn out or carved out of stone in the, in the side of the mountain. We know that that takes money. Um, I, I don't understand, but we know, first of all, he was a Jewish man, okay? But secondly, notice what it says in verse 43. He says, a prominent council member. The term prominent here or honorable, okay, means that he was, he was, he was one who was well-liked. He was one who the world looked at and said, well, we, we, we can look at this guy. He is of good reputation. You know, we, we talked about that a little bit about Job this morning and how Job was a man who feared God and, and shooed or uh, shunned evil. Um, he, he was a man who was blameless. And it's interesting, the Word of God tells us as people, if we're going to be leaders of people, we need to be blameless. We need to be without error, without fault. That doesn't mean we're perfect, and it doesn't mean we're sinless. All of us here in this room sin every day. But the Word of God says we need to be blameless. We need to have a good reputation from those within the church and from those without the church. How do your neighbors view you? Here was a man who was viewed by his peers and by his friends and by society as a good man. He was honorable. He was worthy of respect. You know, there's a lot of people that get into power. And I'm not going to do politics this morning. But there's a lot of people that get into power and I lose total respect for them. Here was a man who was a powerful man because he was on the council. He was part of the Sanhedrin, and he was a man who was honored. He was a man who was respected. Okay, that's what the Word of God, that's how Mark describes him. We also find that he was identified as a religious leader. Notice what it says there in verse 43. He was a religious leader. Why? Because he was a prominent council member. Council member is a reference to the Sanhedrin. It was a reference to the, 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 the spiritual leaders who led Israel. There were the high priest, and then there were the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees who, who came together and they formed the council where the high priest would take care of the spiritual aspects, where the, uh, the, the, the other council members were more of the, the ruling aspects, but together they were the spiritual leaders of that day. Here was a spiritual leader of that day. He was part of the council. Now it's interesting, I asked myself the question, if here was a noble, noble man, 
a man who was without reproach, and he was part of the council. Where was he when Jesus was tried? Why didn't he say anything? Is it possible that, uh, that they said, hey, because he's going to object, we're going to leave him out. That way everybody there is, is going to vote unanimously that Jesus be crucified. I, I don't know. That's possible, but I don't think so. I think in John chapter 19, we find this verse. It's found in verse 38, and I didn't put it on PowerPoint. But it says this. After this, Joseph of, uh, of Arimathea. Now, this is the, this is the picture that we're, that's, it's John's parallel passage to this passage. It says, after this, Joseph, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, and then it says this, for fear of the Jews. He was afraid to lose his position. He was afraid to lose his power. He was maybe afraid to lose the authority that we had, that he had. You know, and I think so often it's true in our own lives. Fear gets in the way, and we're afraid to stand up for Jesus Christ. So do you know something? I'm amongst my friends, and they say something that's offhanded, maybe a, a joke that's a, little, that's a little wrong, and we don't say anything. Well, because, you know, they're coworkers, and, and, and I, I, I'm afraid that it's going to make me, you know, they're, they're not going to want to listen to me anymore. You know, I'm doing it for testimony's sake, because later on I might be able to stand for Jesus Christ. Do you know what I have found? I have found that if you're not consistent in your walk for Jesus, your testimony is blown anyway. Be consistent. Be consistent. You know, here we find there was a man who was afraid. He was fearful. Even though he was a religious leader, and even though he had power, and even though he was, he was liked by many, he was fearful. And so because of that, I think, as Jesus was put on trial, he might have tried to say something, and, and you know, I have something to say, but we're very timidly, and nobody listened to him. You know, I, I think as Christians, we need the boldness of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is what the Word of God says. See, we need to, we need to learn that, you know, we need to be careful of this. But he was identified one other way here in this text. It's interesting, he was a follower. Notice what it says, that, that he, was, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a follower of Jesus. Okay, in John chapter 19, it said this. It said that he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. However, he still didn't understand. See, the disciples at this point didn't understand. We are blessed that we have the complete word of God. We are blessed that we know the beginning from the end. We know what's going to happen. Um, Earl Rowe used to say, you know, I know how the story is going to end. And it's true. I know how the story is going to end too. Jesus Christ is coming again. And you know something? You better be prepared for it. I know how it's going to end. There's some battles in between. I don't necessarily know how the battles are going to be, be, be fought. I don't know how they're, going to, how they're going to turn out. But I can be assured that I'm on the victor's side because Jesus Christ has, has told us that, that we're more than conquerors, that we're victorious. The Word of God has promised that. No matter what you're going through, the Word of God says Jesus is you know, going to bring you that victory. That's an assurance. That's something we can, we can count on if we're willing to follow him and walk with him. But here we find that these, the, 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 the early church still hadn't fully grasped the idea that Jesus Christ was not setting up his kingdom here on earth. They were still looking for that. See, it's interesting. The word of God tells us that when when Andrew, in John chapter 1, I think it's in verse, uh, verse 41, uh, verse, I think I might have written it down, in verse 40 and 41, um, in John chapter 1, it says that Andrew, when he, when he found the Messiah, went to his brother Peter and said, Peter, Peter, come, I want to tell you something. We found the Messiah, the one who's going to set up his king. Listen, the Jewish people were looking for 
the king to come and set up his throne. Okay, who's the king? He was the son of David. He was the one who was promised by God to come and set up his kingdom and his throne, his kingdom would be eternal. The Jewish people were looking for that. They knew that the Messiah was coming. They understood that Isaiah 53, and if you read that text, it talks about how he was rejected and he was oppressed and, and through his stripes we are here. They understood that that's talking about the Messiah. The religious leaders were looking for a Messiah to come and to take over and, and throw Rome out of, their, out of their country. That's what they wanted. Joseph was a follower of Jesus. He understood his teachings. He understood he was the Messiah. He's the one we're waiting for. But he hadn't understood that it wasn't yet time. And I say that because even his disciples, the 12 men that walked with him wherever he went, in Acts chapter 1, it tells us that when Jesus, in verse 6, it says that when Jesus was ready to be taken up to heaven, the disciples look at Jesus and says, Jesus, is now the time you're going to set up your kingdom here on earth? And Jesus looks at them and says, no man knows the time or the hour, only my Father. It's not, up to, it's not, it's not yours to know. And then he's raptured. Then he's taken up to heaven. And the angels come down and say to the disciples, go back into the Jerusalem and wait for, for the Holy Spirit. And we know the story that in Jerusalem, in, in Acts chapter 2, it was a day of Pentecost, 40 days after, okay, the day of Pentecost, we know that Jesus came, or the Holy Spirit came, and empowered these men, and they changed the world. They turned it upside down. Why? Because they fondly understood. We have the benefit of understanding. These men didn't. This man, Joseph, was a man who followed God. How many people today say they follow God? I know God, but they miss Jesus Christ. They miss the fact that Jesus is the way to God. We were talking about that at RU. We were talking about that other times this week. I've talked about that. How, how, how people don't mind talking about God, but when you start talking about Jesus, it's a whole different story. Don't want Jesus. You know, you can stand with any religion in the world and talk about God because they have their God, and they say, well, one, our God is one. I, I, I despise, and if you have this on your, on, on your car, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I say this, but I despise that bumper sticker that has all the different religions on it and talks about the unity between all these different different religions why because we're all one under god yes we're all one under god but there's a difference between my god and your god if you don't know the god of jehovah the god of israel the god through jesus christ because the god of islam is not the same god that i serve and i worship we need to understand that you know, we need to understand that it's all through Jesus Christ. These men hadn't fully understood that. And because of that, these men, I believe Joseph and Nicodemus, and I don't know if there was anybody else, but they're the two I know in Scripture for sure were probably here burying Christ. These men didn't fully understand why, because they weren't fully, they weren't fully shown by the Holy Spirit yet. And because of that, they were fearful. And you know something? The Word of God tells us not to be fearful. Why? Because it's easy to be fearful. And we need to be careful, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So we find, first of all, Joseph. Secondly, we find, um, uh, we, we find a, a, a second person in here, and that's Pilate. See, we find, first of all, Joseph's request, but we find Pilate's response. And I, I like how it starts there in verse 44, and it says, And Pilate marveled. He was shocked. Now, I tend to think he was shocked for two reasons. One, he was shocked that Jesus was already dead. Okay, we know that because he calls the centurion and said, tell me about this Jesus. They want the body, but I don't want the body to come down until he's truly dead. And tell me about the body. And the centurion says, yes, he's been dead for a while. But I think there was another reason why, why he was shocked. Here's a man who was part of that group who came and asked to crucify this guy, is now coming back and asking for his body? I, I think Pilate for a minute probably scratched his head, said, what are you guys doing? 
Can't you, can't you get everybody on one page here? You know, he was confused. Why? Because Pilate, we had learned earlier, Pilate had said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Pilate found nothing wrong with Jesus. He didn't want to crucify Christ. He even tried coming up with all kinds of excuses why they shouldn't crucify Christ. Let's, let's, you know, let's put him up against Barabbas. Why? He's a killer, and here's the king of the Jews, and, and maybe, maybe you'll choose to, to release Jesus instead of... Bar no, no, we want Barabbas. You know, Pilate saw that Jesus was different, but now here's a guy asking for his body. Okay, there was a little, I think, a little confusion there, but he marveled that a council member would come and ask for the body of Christ. But notice the question that he asks the, um, asks the centurion. Look what it says in verse 44. And first he, he, he summoned the centurion. What centurion? I, I submit to you it was the centurion who was at the cross. Who else would have known if he was dead or not? It was the centurion at the cross. And if you go back about eight verses, okay, to verse 39. It's probably not eight verses, but you go back to verse 39, and you find that so when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this is the Son of God. So here's a centurion who I submit to you had been transformed by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He comes to Pilate and says, yes, he is dead. Why? Because he gave up the ghost. He didn't die like everybody else. Everybody else, the other two prisoners that were crucified with Christ, they went by and they broke their legs. They came to Christ. They didn't have to break the legs. Well, why? Because, that, because the Word of God tells us that the Lamb of God should not have any bones broken. Remember back in Exodus chapter 12 when Jesus institutes the Passover? They tell, uh, God tells Moses, tell the people to eat in a hurry because, because they're going to be leaving, um, to eat in a hurry. And then part of that regulation was this. In one house it shall be eaten and you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. See, the Lamb of God was not to be broken. Bones were not to be broken. And remember what John the Baptist said in John chapter 1 and verse 29? In John chapter 1 and verse 29, Jesus, John saw Jesus coming to him the next day, it says. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist understood who Jesus was, and he said, Here's, John, here's Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, not a bone was broken why? Because he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He took your sin, he took my sin. But the centurion saw that. Listen, the death on the cross was a cruel death. It could last days. I read somewhere that, this, that the soldiers would give water to the, uh, to the prisoners who were hanging. And the comment was this. They didn't do it out of compassion. They did it so the torture would go on longer. That's how cruel the crucifixion was. But at 3 o'clock, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the, 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 uh, the, the veil in the temple was torn, and the price for our sin was taken care of. Jesus finally says, it is finished. And then he looks up to heaven and says, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. Jesus gave his life. Nobody took it from him. And when, when the centurion told that to, um, to, uh, to Pilate, Pilate says this. Look what it says there in verse 45. Verse, uh, um, he's, it says, and he had been dead for some time. It's probably about two hours, three hours now, almost three hours. And so in verse 45, it says, so when he found out that from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. You know, the word body here is a different bo body than in other passages. The body here means corpse. He's given the dead body. And I think the, bo the, the Bible emphasizes the fact that Jesus was truly dead. Don't let anybody tell you, well, Jesus really didn't die. His disciples got him down and they revived him. No, 
The word that's used here means that it was a corpse. He was truly dead. And, and Pilate says to, uh, to Joseph, okay, you may have the corpse. You may have his dead body. That was, that was not really done, but Pilate allowed it to be done. Why? Because of fulfillment of prophecy. You know, God doesn't do anything by chance. You're not here today by chance. God does everything with a purpose. And even the death on the cross, because, see, the Romans liked to leave the bodies decay on the cross. Because what it would do, it would, it would help people understand that you break the law, this is going to happen to you. You know, I've always said, I've always said this in America. You know, we, we live in a society today where, where when you do something wrong, you get a little slap on your, fi- on your hand and, and, you're, and you go and you can continue doing. I've always said, you know, if you really punish the criminal, and, and, and I'm not, you know, our, our law, I, I, need to, I need to be careful how I say this, because our law system is, is broken, okay? We need to understand that, okay? However, when you, when you commit a crime, if you're truly punished for that crime, it will prevent others from doing the same crime. I really believe that. Why did my father, when I disobeyed my father, and I did something wrong, why did my father call me into the living room and say, Randy, we first had to go get the switch, which was miserable, okay? And, uh, and then we had to come in, we had to bend over, touch our toes, you know, and, and we didn't have pants on, we had to pull our pants down, okay? And he smacked us on the bottom in front of the rest of the household, okay? He did that publicly. Why was it a public punishment? Is it because, because he got joy in doing so? No, it was so that others in the family would learn. You do what Randy did, you're going to be punished for it. Okay, that keeps crime away. Rome did that to keep crime away. I'm going to leave the body on the cross. Okay, and then when they finally took him down, they threw him in a pile of heap. Okay, heap pile, trash. Okay, that's how they operated. But it's interesting here, he allows... Pilate allows Joseph to take the body and bury the body. Why? For the fulfillment of Scripture. Why? Because Scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, in verse 9, it says, And he made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. The rich man gave Christ that tomb, fulfillment of prophecy. See, Jesus understood. Even when Jesus cried out, we'll see this on Friday night, when Jesus cried out, I thirst. It was for fulfillment of prophecy. Christ came to fulfill prophecy. God's plan was to to be done and to be fulfilled. And and Jesus was part of that plan. Pilate was part of that plan. Listen, Judas Iscariot was part of that plan. You know, we need to understand God takes what we have and he uses it in his perfect will. In your life, there are things that happen that you might not enjoy, you might not understand, and you might look at God and say, Lord, why? Why are you doing this to me? But God has a perfect plan, and he knows what he's doing. He takes the things that are around us, and he helps to mold us and to make us into the people he wants us to be. This is what he's doing on the cross for you and me. That's grace. I don't have to go through this because Jesus did. What a wonderful picture that is. And then there's a... There's a Fourth thing we find, okay, we found, um, we found number, number one was uh, Joseph's request, number two was Pilate's response, number three was Jesus' burial, and, uh, and we didn't look at that much, but it says in verse 43, that, or 46, that they took the body down and wrapped them in linens, that was the custom to wrap them in linens, and to put spices on it. It's interesting, they don't say anything about spices, and I believe that when the women, there in verse 47, we're going to talk about, that the the fourth thing is the women's observation, and the women noticed that there was no spices. And that's why the next day, notice chapter 16, now I'm getting into my message next week, for next week, but look what it says. Now when when, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and uh, Salome brought what? Spices. Why? to finish what Joseph didn't have time to do, to put spices on the body. That was part of custom. We wrap them in linen and we put spices on them. Okay, 
the women came to finish the job in the morning. But we find here the observation of the women. Do you know they observed where he was buried? They followed Jesus and knew exactly where he was buried. They saw not only where he was buried, but they saw how he was buried. And they needed to change that. Now, now that's the text, okay? Let me give you the challenge. Okay, I think the challenge is this. Two groups of people. One group has courage. One group has fear. The people who should have courage were the spiritual leaders. They knew what they were doing. Instead, they had fear. The courage comes with the women. Notice in verse 40, 40 and 41, it says that the women, look what it says there in verse 40 and 41. It says this, there were women also looking from afar, amongst whom were Mary Magdalene, the, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus, or of James the lesser, and, uh, and Jose and Salome. You know, we, we find that these women had enough courage to stand for Christ and to follow Christ no matter what that meant. They were at the beatings. They were at the, uh, at the cross. They were at the burial. They saw all that, and they weren't afraid to stand there no matter what people said, no matter what kind of, what kind of ridicule they got, no matter, no matter if that meant that somebody would... Would, would take matters in their own hands and, you know, throw something at them or whatever. They stood with their Savior. These are the ladies who ministered to Christ all through his ministry. That's what the Word of God tells us. And then there was those who feared, and we already saw those who feared. You know, I submit to you today that we as God's children need to have courage, okay? And I've asked myself, what is courage? Okay, it's interesting. Courage... Mark Twain says, courage is the resistance to fear, Mast mastery of fear, not the absence of fear. We always think that courage is the absence of fear. No, it's not. Courage is a willingness to do things that we need to do even when we are fearful. That's what the women had. Let me give you three things that I came up with with regards to courage. Number one, uh, courageous people risk their lives to do what is right. That's what the ladies did. The men, Joseph, Nicodemus, Nicodemus came to Christ by night because he was afraid of what people would say. Joseph, we're told Joseph was a secret follower of Christ because he was afraid of what people would say. Courageous people aren't afraid to risk their life to do what is right. Why? Because they know that that's what God would want them to do. In a similar manner, courageous people risk reputation to do what is right. Not only do you risk your life, but you risk your reputation. See, I tend to think that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's a change in us. And that change is in everything of life. That means that the friends we hung around with, the people that we were close to, the music we listened to, the way we dress, all that changes. Why? Because we're new in Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17 tells us. That in all things, we're new. Do you know the problem we have in Christians today? is that we want to be Christians and we want to say, I'm a, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ, but the world can't see a difference in us. We're doing exactly what the world does. Let me ask you something. Is America a godly nation today? I would venture to say most of us in this room, I would hope most of us in this room would say, no, America is far from godly. So why do you want to act like the world? Why do you want to act like everybody else if you're a Christian? The, word, the, the Bible says we're going to act differently. You know, when the boss asks you to, 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 you know, come in five minutes early because, you know, he wants you there on time, come in ten minutes early. Why? Because you're a Christian. You know, if somebody wants to give, if somebody asks for your shirt, give them your cloak is what the Word of God says. Go the extra mile. See, as Christians, our likes and dislikes have changed. 
Why? Because I like what God wants. And it doesn't matter what people think of me. Do you know something? I would rather the Lord say to me, well done, thy good and faithful servant, than my neighbor say to me, wow, you're a good man. I don't care if my neighbor thinks I'm a good man. I do care if God thinks I'm a good man. See, that's what we're talking about here. Fear gets in the way of us, of us sharing who we are before men. And you know something? Courageous people were willing to risk their lives, their reputation to do what is right. But there's a third thing. Courageous people are bold in representing Christ. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's the question. I asked it earlier. Who is on the Lord's side. Who is willing to say? Are you willing to say, yes, I'm going to be bold for Jesus Christ. I'm going to not worry about my reputation. I'm not going to worry. Listen, it's that, you know, we work hard at leaving a legacy. We work hard at our reputation. We work hard at, at, at doing that kind of thing. Do you, know the, do you know what you should be working hard at? You should be working hard at pleasing Jesus Christ because the Word of God says when you seek you seek ye first, when you seek first the kingdom of God, and then it says his righteousness. You know, all of us say, oh, if we seek the kingdom of God, God says that all other things will be added. No, that's not what the word of God says. The word of God says when we seek God first and his righteousness. You know what that means? That means doing things God's way. When we work at doing things God's way, everything else will fall into place. That's what I want. Who is on the Lord's side? Are you on the Lord's side today? Are you willing to stand and say, it doesn't matter. I might be afraid. I might be scared. But do you know something? Lord, you have not given me the spirit of fear and of timidity, but of courage, willingness to stand for what is right. I'm going to stand for what is right. I'm going to have boldness. And the Word of God says we don't only have boldness here on earth to preach. I mean, the apostles got boldness, and they went and they turned the world upside down. We have boldness to enter the throne room of God. What a wonderful picture that is. Is that who you are today? I can't answer that for you. Only you can. Whose side are you on? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word today. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would make a commitment right now today that, Lord, we are going to be on the Lord's side. There's too many of us, too many even right here in this room that like playing the middle of the road. I'm going to call myself a Christian. I'm going to... I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to do these things, but it, it's all an exercise of the mind not of the heart. Lord, I pray for everybody in this room. I pray for those listening today, for those who will be listening this week, that, Lord, they would make a commitment. They would say, Lord, we are willing to stand for what is right, for doing righteously. Lord, help us be willing to be on the Lord's side. Lord, I do thank you. Before I say amen, if the Lord spoke to your heart, if you realize, well, maybe this week you haven't been really on the Lord's side, you've done your own thing instead of God's thing, or, or you know, and I'm not even talking about your salvation, I'm just talking about, you know, you as a Christian today, you know you're saved, but you know, it's so easy to allow yourself to do what you want instead of what God wants. Are you willing to say, yes, I'm going to do what God wants me to do? We just raise your hand, you don't have to look up, just raise your hand, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How about you here today who, you can't be on the Lord's side if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching today and you've never come to a place where you have accepted the perfect gift, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for your sin. Would you accept that today? Would you just say, Pastor, pray for me? I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you're online and that's your prayer today, would you email me? Say, Pastor, explain this to me. But it's so simple. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All you have to do is ask, Lord, save me. And he will. He knows your heart. Father, thank you for the hands that went up today. Lord, I pray that we would stand firm on you. I thank you in Christ Jesus' name.
Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back down, come back up. We're going to sing Who is on the Lord's Side. Let's stand together as we sing. Just a reminder for our church family. Uh, most of us have been missing Tom and Helena Rigner. Tom Rigner's birthday is this week, I think on Tuesday. Um, give him a call, give him a, give him a, send a note out to him. Just let him know he's missed. I know that would be a great encouragement to him. Let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you that, Lord, we can come into your house today. We can worship you. And, uh, Lord, as we leave here, we go out into our mission field. We go out into the world. And Lord, we need to be ambassadors for you. We need to be lighthouses for you. So let us go out being on the Lord's side. Lord, we do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.